we have uh, uh, the last video present presentation for this meeting um, with Mark Miller. And I think we got plenty of people here. So Mark, please. Okay, uh, I'm Mark Miller. Uh, I've been a member of TC39 now for about 10 years. And the goal I've been working on, I'm calling here extremely modular distributed JavaScript. But the vision that's driving me towards the goal is a vision of networks of cooperative computation that span the world. The world, our world, has always consisted of networks of interaction among potential adversaries. And the progress of civilization is largely the discovery of institutions, arrangements, patterns that push potential adversaries into cooperating with each other. Computer networks are now intimately enmeshed in our world, preventing, uh, presenting us with vast opportunities to amplify the degree to which we cooperate with each other. But those same computers also bring with them tremendous <coughs> risks of cooperating and those risks stand in the way of realizing those opportunities. If we can lower the risks of cooperation, we can build a much more cooperative world. So what do I mean about cooperating with programs? Well, once upon a time, when users wanted to run programs that did useful work for the users, they would run applications on traditional operating systems. And those applications could do many, many good things for them. They were very rich, but at the price that they could also do many, many things to them. When a user ran Solitaire, Solitaire was allowed by the operating system to delete all of the user's files. In reaction to this, the early web created the Java sandbox, in which the code was safe because it couldn't do any damage to you but at the price that it also couldn't do hardly anything for you. The applets were essentially worthless, useless rather, uh, and quickly disappeared from the web. We also composed programs together so that they can cooperate to give us ever greater functionality. But as we compose programs together, rather than cooperate or in addition to cooperating, they might destructively interfere with each other. And this uh, propensity for destructive interference limits the scale at which we can successfully compose programs and derive greater benefit. For example, in shared memory multi-threading in the concurrency realm, if the individual components do enough locking that they can be confident they're maintaining their safety, they often do so at the price of inducing deadlock under composition. If they're stingy enough with locking to, to avoid the deadlock dangers and ensure progress, they often do so as the danger of their consistency. So what's going on in both of these cases is various forms of destructive interference that limit the scale at which we can compose systems. Now, software engineering studies accidental interference, bugs, and tries to reduce both their frequency and their severity. Computer security studies intentional interference, again, trying to reduce both their frequency and severity. But why should we care whether the bugs, whether the interference is accidental or intentional? If we build systems that are robust against intentional interference, they will also be robust against accidental interference. And many of the same techniques are, are uh, very effective against both. So the progress of computer science has not removed the need to trade off functionality and safety, but it's been a discovery over time of modularity mechanisms, abstraction mechanisms, arrangements and patterns that have uh, given programs more, more opportunity to cooperate safely at less risk. 
it has lifted the trade-off curve. So for the same level of safety, we get more functionality. For the same level of functionality, we can engage in those patterns more safely. And what I mean by extreme modularity is to take inspiration from what has been working in our practices of modularity and to go as far as we practically can in that direction. As we've done that on this committee, uh, every step that we've taken in that direction has had payoffs. I started in the days of ECMAScript 3. We introduced ECMAScript 5 strict mode as a major cleanup of the language. Uh, it defined a sublanguage, an enforceable sublanguage, um, uh, in which much of the old crap was left behind. It's a rare subtractive step for a standards committee. In pursuit of true encapsulation, we first prepared the lexical scope so that closures could be genuinely encapsulating, all the way up to uh, today, all of our involvement in trying to bring true hard private states to classes. The property descriptor, descriptor system was designed to give us absolute stability guarantees so you, know, you knew when the world could not change out from under you. Proxies and weak maps are a mechanism to uh, virtualize other objects um, by transparently intermediating between them, uh, giving us a whole host of, of ways to emulate various properties. Uh, had template literals give us a way to avoid, to avoid injection hazards. And the promises that we have derive very directly from the promises in my e-language, which were designed both to support distributed computation as well as manage local asynchrony. Uh, so far in JavaScript, we've used them very, very effectively for local asynchrony, but the design remains one that accommodates distributed computation. Each of these steps is useful in its own right, but is also an enabler of further progress. By using these enablers, we built the SES library. SES is Secure ECMAScript. Uh, and what Secure ECMAScript does is it creates an, a, a further sublanguage, which it enforces, which is an object capability language that does much more to prevent destructive interference between components. Uh, Earth Engine is a very good example of what it's good for. Earth Engine, Google Earth Engine, is an application framework built to accept third-party plugins that add value, such as geospatial computations. Earth Engine wants to have an intimate interaction with those plugins, so it opens up an object-to-object an -object API for interacting with the plugins, but the plugins may be fallible, they might be buggy, they might be vulnerable, uh, and Earth Engine wants to protect its own integrity against flaws in those plugins. Salesforce solved a similar composition problem. They want to uh, integrate together a, from third parties a weather app, a map app, a finance app, and to do so on the same page and enable them to interact both intimately and safely. So they created the locker service, which is very similar to, to SES. And we're working together uh, to, to move <coughs> to rebuild both SES and the locker service on top of the first Realms proposal before the committee. How much um, of a difficulty is with the DOM versus ECMAScript here? The, um, I'm really talking about ECMAScript. And for this particular application, the DOM is relevant because of the way Salesforce did it. For the Earth Engine, it is not relevant because the plugins are not given access to the DOM. They only see a JavaScript. Link. systems protect against destructive interference? What's the nature of the destructive interference we're trying to protect against? Well, largely, it's coupling through state changes, where one component modifies a state in a way that, that 
violates the assumptions, misleads, confuses another component. And we can see coupling as coming, as degrees of coupling as being on a spectrum. At the top, we have systems with no modularity at all, in which potentially everything is coupled with everything else. Uh, when something goes wrong, you have no idea why. It's very hard to crack down. So we can take those off the table. At the bottom, we have systems that have no uh, coupling because they have no state, um, or, or in general because they're solving some other problem, not the problem that requires uh, wrestling with stateful coupling. Um, so we can take those off the table. On the second line, we have the practice of modularity uh, that teaches us how to create loosely coupled systems at no loss of functionality. Um, and what I mean by extreme modularity is uh, to practice the principle of least coupling, by which I mean it's just that the least coupling is the least coupling needed between the components uh, for them to achieve the desired functionality and no more coupling than that. That's a limit. The principle of least coupling is to try to approach that limit. You'll never reach it, but to try to approach that limit as close as is practical. And as you approach the limit, you reduce the possibility of destructive interference that would have been caused by the coupling you have now emitted. So in the spatial realm, we started with the von Neumann machine, the von Neumann address space, uh, abstracted, so to speak, by C and C++, in which you have this, you have this undebuggable nightmare where everything can step on everything. And when something goes wrong, good luck trying to figure it out. So we can take that off the table. Uh, at the bottom, you have pure functional languages like Haskell, which are beautiful for the problems domain that they're the problem domain that they're applicable to. But we're trying to deal with a distributed, stateful world, and they largely don't address the problems of our concern. So we can take those off the table. The second row are the systems that, that point the way forward, the memory-safe languages like Java and JavaScript, in which there's very really <coughs> effective distance. Um, when something goes wrong, you have a hope of figuring out under the debugger. And object capability systems like SCS are trying to take that principle and amplify it uh, in order to give you more reliable local reasoning so that things are much less able to interfere with each other, essentially by extending the philosophy of memory safety farther. Hey Mark, is it OK to interject? Uh, very briefly. OK, I'm just curious about two, two languages. Uh, well, Haskell <coughs> is used by the Galois connection people are doing all sorts of things with it. So I'm wondering if you OK. Why are you just missed it? So, so in Haskell, there are ways to model state. There's a lot of different ways to model state. I mean, the STM stuff came from Haskell. Um, Haskell, of course, monads is the way to model state. Um, uh, but the problem is, once you're modeling state, now you've got, you're essentially defining a new level of abstraction. And all these issues reappear in terms of what is the logic of the state that you're modeling? What is the logic you're bringing? And that's essentially doing language design on top of Haskell. Haskell's great material to do that. So they start to look more like the middle. That's right. That's exactly right. What about Rust? Do you include it here or not? I, I, um, I, uh, on this slide, I um, include Rust um, uh, as memory safe. And I actually, at an earlier, I'm going to make this, I'm going to stop after this comment. Um, I actually included Rust as right on the boundary between the second and third rows because there's so little that you would need to change about Rust to make it an object capability language. It's really crying out to be an object capability language. Uh, sorry, I, I meant to squeeze one more in. Sorry. How about timing channels? Big issue. I'm, uh, ask, after the talk, okay. come back to, to right. those. OK. Um, OK, so in the temporal realm, we start with, at the bottom row, sequential imperative programming. Um, everything from the early algol to Python, in which there, 
in which there is no interleaving of changes. There's no concurrency to speak of. So um, there's no possibility of destructive interference by the timing of that interleaving. At the top, we have shared memory multi-threading systems like Java and pthreads, which in the temporal realm is as much of a debugging disaster as the vulnerable address space was in the spatial realm. You're starting off with maximal possible interleaving at a finer grain even than instructions. And then you introduce this locking uh, mechanisms that very, very few people can learn how to use effectively in order to control that interleaving. So we can take that off the table. On the second row, we have the systems that point their way forward, um, the shared nothing systems like Erlang, Rust, and Pony, that give us the ability to do local reasoning and the communicating event loop systems, which are shared nothing systems, but in addition, the atomicity of turn enables us to engage in a form of transactional reasoning. Uh, and JavaScript itself has always been a communicating event loop system. It's also in the top line, line now. Yeah, it's also, yeah. I mean, we just right. it's it's also in the top line. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. And uh, everyone who is here during those days remembers um, uh, my discomfort with that. Uh, but yes, it is, it is also on the top line. OK. So to increase cooperative opportunities, we want to reduce the risks of cooperation. What are these risks, and how should we go about reducing them? Well, we can visualize the risk as an attack surface, where the, where the attack surface is, is um, the multiplication of these two dimensions, is integrating over the product of these dimensions, where in the vertical dimension, we have the various fallible agents that are operating on resources. And the number of fallible agents um, and the fallibility of the agents gives us some crude measure of the likelihood that uh, there's a flaw in those agents that can be exploited. On the horizontal dimensions, we have the assets that are at risk to exploitation of a flaw in any of those agents, the resources that can be damaged. And integrating over the probability of, of an exploitable flaw, uh, together with the damage that might result from exploiting it, gives you a good first approximation of expected risk. So to reduce risk, what we want to do is hollow out the attack surface. So the, some of the early operating systems, like ITS and MIT, uh, did multiplex the computer among multiple users, but had absolutely no protection whatsoever. Everyone could mess with everything. The attack surface was complete. Operating systems early on discovered the idea of separate user accounts with inter-account protection, in which Ellen could mess with Ellen's stuff, Barb could mess with Barb's stuff, Doug could mess with Doug's stuff, and Barb could share some of her stuff with Ellen, and everyone's stuff was vulnerable to a bug in the kernel or the root account, uh, and I'm going to cause that call that component of systems the TCB, the Trusted Computing Base, which is the component that's responsible for doing the division of these rights, uh, which, if it has a bug, places all the rights that it is supposed to divide at risk. Now, this is very good. It's hollowed out the attack surface sum. But let's take a look at Doug's box, the box representing Doug manipulating Doug's stuff. Let's zoom in on it. Back in the bad old world of applications, this attack surface was also complete. Every application that Doug runs, uh, runs as Doug and could, that could um, destroy all of his stuff. That goes back to solitaire can delete all of Doug's files. The labels on this diagram come from a case study we did of Cap Desk, an early system that I worked on. But the, this transition that I'm showing is representative of modern systems in general. Uh, the browser enables uh, Doug to run different pieces of code on his behalf, each of which are given different uh, access to different resources of Doug's. 
Uh, the Android and iOS security model enables Doug to install apps and give them divergent rights to his stuff. Um, uh, but, Doug's, Doug, but the component, the browser or the desktop, that multiplexes them, all of Doug's stuff is still vulnerable to that. Can't do anything about that. Um, let's, let's zoom in on the Catmail app. If the Catmail app is written in C or C++, then any resource given to the Catmail app as a whole is, uh, at, is vulnerable to any bug anywhere in the Catmail app. But if Catmail is written in a memory-safe language, or better, an object capability language, then we have reduced vulnerability at this point. Uh, the address book module within the Catmail app doesn't have to put Doug's PGP key ring at risk. And the address book, of course, uh, itself being a module written in an object capability language, um, uh, the objects themselves are further decoupled, and not everything given to the address book has to be vulnerable to a flaw anywhere in the code of the address book. So what's going on here is We've taken a step from defensive programming, where we hollow out the attack surface here and there as opportunity presents, to defense in depth, where we systematically hollow out the attack surface at every scale of composition. And by doing it at every scale of composition, we get a multiplicative benefit. If at each scale we can remove half of the attack surface, then the aggregate attack surface is a half times a half times a half. Now, given these overall goals, why pursue them in JavaScript? Well, the obvious answer is the ubiquity. But what will surprise many computer scientists is that JavaScript is actually technically superior than other widely available dimension platforms on a whole variety of dimensions. And most of these go back to ES3. I'm going to focus in on two. JavaScript has a, has a separation that is an almost perfect analogy to the separation between user mode computation and system mode computation. The JavaScript language defined by this committee is a language with no I.O. It's essentially just pure computational language. But it provides for JavaScript objects to call system objects. System objects are the means by which JavaScript computation reaches the outside world. Uh, and so when a JavaScript object calls a, a host object, uh, it's effectively doing a system call. And authority reachable only by scope. The only way a JavaScript object gets initial access to a host object is by looking up a name in the global scope. Uh, so if you can intervene on that namespace lookup, you stand in a perfect position to censor or virtualize all access to the outside world. Okay, so that's why JavaScript. Why distributing? Let's go back again to the early web. In the original web, the browser only displayed passive HTML pages, and all interaction with the user is when the user would click on a link or a button, it would send a message to objects on the server that we calculate a new HTML page, which they return to the browser. The Ajax revolution was the revolution of mobile code as protocol, where the servers will also return code to the browser, explaining to the browser how to interact with the user. And the objects in the browser could send asynchronous messages back to objects on the server through XHR. And servers found they could imitate browsers to other servers, bringing about the world of web services. The same origin policy attempted to restrict the communication pathways to the one shown. However, programmers had so much need to communicate on the other pathways that they found various bu browser bugs, which they then exploited in massive numbers, uh, such that those browser bugs became entrenched and written into web standards. Those have since been replaced with better web standards uh, to enable communication along the other paths. Uh, so now we have, we have 
uh, objects in event loops can send asynchronous messages to objects in event loops elsewhere, but each of these transports has an annoyingly different API and annoyingly different semantics. What's really going on here, though, is simply achieving a world of objects and event loops sending messages, asynchronous messages, to objects and other event loops. So if we abstract over the differences in these transports the way the Q connection library does, where Q connection lets an object in one event loop hold a remote promise to an object in another event loop, allowing at the object level the delivery of asynchronous messages, uh, realizing the, the, um, the other half of the goals of the promise design that we have, um, now you've got a general web of distributed objects where for many purposes, not for all purposes, you can ignore the differences in the transports, you can ignore where these event loops are located, and you just have this nice uniform world of a, a world-spanning graph of objects uh, sending messages to each other. These objects and the event loops that they're inside of themselves run in various hosts. What are these hosts? When I joined the committee, there was really only one host that was of central concern to the committee, which was the browsers. We now also have, have the servers as a central concern to the committee, largely through, uh, largely because of Node.js. And now, uh, with the modelable guys having joined us, uh, we're also focused on uh, embedded IoT uses of JavaScript as a first-class concern, uh, a, a, a yet another hosting environment for the language. And now, with Jorge joining us from Gravity, uh, we also have a representation from the world of crypto commerce, the world of the blockchain, cryptocurrency, crypto commerce, which is a multi-billion dollar new sector of the economy. And JavaScript is being used in that world. First of all, Ethereum's Solidity language is already recognized as JavaScript-like and was clearly inspired by JavaScript. But all the rest of these projects that I list here are systems using JavaScript itself in this world, I'm going to focus in on two. My own Dr. Seth system, which is distributed, resilient, secure ECMAScript, uh, adding the, uh, distribution and resilience uh, to SES. And Jorge's Gravity Project, which builds on Dr. Seth. This is a substantial smart contract written in Dr. Sess. It brings about an escrow exchange between mutually suspicious parties. It deals this one piece of code, really just this one piece of code when running on the Dr. Sess platform, deals with the mutual suspicion issues among objects, the mutual suspicion issues among communicating machines, and deals with the distributed systems failures that are inherent in distributed computation. And the reason I can write this in one page of easily explainable code is by leveraging the extreme modularity of the Dr. Sess platform. Dr. Sess was conceived to run co the contracts on the box shown as the contract house, where each box here is a separate physical machine. And the, contract, the contracts running on the contract house stand between and coordinate these other four physical machines. Since I originally conceived this, the world has not been willing to accept a mutually trusted third-party machine as a currency issuer. So today, the currency issuers of interest are things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, in the Ethereum case on the right, um, the miners, the Ethereum miners, um, synthesize a virtual Ethereum machine by consensus among them. Um, so the Ethereum machine and their shared thought bubble. And in the case of Ethereum, that's a general purpose virtual machine that can run arbitrary uh, computation. So uh, what many people are doing 
is move, treating, using it also as the contract test, moving the contract so they run on the Ethereum machine. But in so doing, they sacrifice privacy. Uh, what happens on the Ethereum machine is, is visible to everyone. Uh, and they create a huge scaling problem because the whole world is, is competing to be the next construction of the, of the synthesized Ethereum machine. So instead, what Jorge is doing is by letting Alice and Bob run appropriate instrumented JavaScript systems, is they can synthesize privately between them uh, a Dr. Sess machine, which can then interact cryptographically with the rest of the world. So, in conclusion, by focusing on this trade-off and how to move it upward, by reducing the possibilities of destructive interference without loss of functionality, we take a huge step towards enabling a world of much greater computer-mediated cooperation. And now I'll take questions. Yeah. So what are the implications of this over the long run for TC39? TC well, the, uh, essentially um, just continuing uh, with the path that, that already gave us those things on the slide that you saw. Um, uh, the next thing on the agenda, of course, is realms and frozen realms. Um, uh, but beyond that, um, the, uh, the promise design uh, has the potential uh, for the distributed communication. Um, and uh, we know that not just because of the previous <coughs> history of the e-language, but because of the Q connection library. Uh, uh, there are, um, <coughs> one, of the, one of the problems with the Q connection library um, is uh, it has to, it has a distributed storage management problem because of the lack of weak references. That's one of the reasons that uh, I'm very interested in, in uh, moving weak references forward. So, I mean, I can go on and on about the various different proposals, but altogether, the proposals that, um, that would advance us along this trajectory, again, each time have many other payoffs, and the arguments for the proposals are also include why the, the motivations from many of the other payoffs as well as advancing this agenda. Does this agenda suggest things that we should not do or we should avoid? Yes. Um, so uh, going back to the shape security vision talk, uh, one of the things that uh, they mentioned uh, is um, uh, that it should be an explicit goal uh, to not introduce hidden I.O. or hidden uh, mutable state into the primordials. Um, uh, each bit of, of hidden I.O. or hidden mutable state of the primordials becomes a security nightmare um, for, this, um, for this direction. Uh, and in general, one of the reasons why I've been so religious about attending virtually every meeting of this group over the last 10 years is to catch uh, situations where, where some proposal would accidentally blow one of the uh, security properties of JavaScript, making this thing harder. Uh, one of the things that we desperately do need to do, and I have done way too little of, I have to, have to repair that, is to, instead of just being the guardian with, with the invariance only in my head, is to do what, what you know, Tom Van Kutzen did with the property invariance is to actually state what the invariants are that must not be broken. And I certainly need to do a lot more of that. OK, uh, we are uh, over time, and we are running short. Like, uh, okay. you, yes, you're, you have raised them, so. OK, so I, I'm just going to say in terms of the security. I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. So uh, you're advocating for hollowing out the matrix of uh, who can uh, mess with what, uh, but uh, and. So, uh, the ecosystem has been doing some of that, especially with iOS and uh, such. Uh, the net result is that things become very non-programmable. So 
uh, you can't script your mail application anymore because scripting, <laughs> allowing scripting in your mail application would uh, expand the matrix of uh, you know, who can uh, mess with what. So what, do you have an answer to that? Uh, yes. Um, uh, so one of the early users of SES, or rather, one of the early, one of the early users of the predecessor to SES uh, was Google Apps Script. And uh, Apps Script was using um, one technique, actually, to do something like object capabilities on the server, and then using the predecessor to SES um, to do Just Kaha. Yeah, this is, this is the JavaScript component of Kaha. SES is now part of modern Kaha. Ka is basically the JavaScript component combined with Domato for securing the browser API. Um, and in, so the modern browser, it's, it's Domato plus SES. On older browsers, it was Domato plus the ES5 <coughs> to ES3 translator. We actually had this very expensive translator back to ES3 embedding the, the, the ES5 semantics, including all the emulation of property descriptors and all the enforcement mechanisms of property descriptors. And despite the expense of that, uh, AppScript used it for years, and the, re and the motivation was um, exactly to enable scripting of applications, the extending of their functionality by scripting, but still be able to control what authority was given to what script. Uh, the reason why App Engine is no longer using it is because the ES3, the, the ES5 to ES3 translator uh, had lots of costs. Especially, the, especially startup costs, because they had to do this rather gargantuan initialization of the environment. But I very much believe in the principles that they demonstrate. Uh, and with this stuff being supported better, we can regain those principles. Once again, Earth Engine is being extended by people writing scripts, these, these plugins, which are being plugged into Earth Engine, which Earth Engine is intimately interacting with, while still protecting itself. Right. Likewise, Salesforce, Salesforce blocker service. Think of yet another demonstration that you can have extensibility, adding value by, by third parties writing code, adding value to the framework, and still allow intimate interaction. The gains from that with protection. Okay. Rather, I can just state from. I'm sorry, it's never, please. Uh, I've worked at companies who wish they had this level of isolation and they couldn't easily obtain it, so they had to abandon that goal. So it is a good goal for me. Okay, thank you. OK, we are pretty much over time. Uh, we have. Uh,